Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vasil Gazizulin. I'm happy to uh, launch this first global franchise conference. It's a global event that we start today. And uh, I really appreciate that you participate in us and you join us these uh, hard days. And you are all busy and you are all from all over the world. And uh, let me say a few words why we organizing this conference, why we doing this and uh, personally about me and uh, about our team, the organizers and the speakers of the conference. First of all, I really appreciate all of you who can see us. I will run this conference today. These two hours, it will be completely useful information for you. And uh, uh, please uh, uh, allow me to introduce myself and all of the speakers. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vasil Gazizulin. I'm the founder of the top franchise.com, uh, the global franchise marketplace. And uh, uh, we are organizing this event online because we realize that all offline events uh, globally all over the world is still closed. So we need to join and we need to uh, unite together to exchange the information what we have about the franchise market and about the how we can run our franchise concept how to buy franchise and how to sell a lot of franchise the most useful information for you for this conference is the exact tools how which you can use to sell your franchise and i really welcome and appreciate investors who join this conference you can see which kind of markets which franchise is really good for this period We're really good for this time to be uh, on uh, on the market in this uh, COVID uh, reality that we have right now. So uh, what we do this uh, uh, during this conference, uh, we will talk about few markets. This conference is uh, dedicated to the geographic uh, spread of the franchise industry. We will talk uh, and see how the situation is uh, um, in specific markets such as Asia, Asia and uh, right after me and uh, uh, Yuri and the Herman will be the um, Albert Kong. And uh, uh, right after that, it will be, uh, we will see the Felix Duvid and after that, the Alex de Passe. All these guys you see in our uh, informations in our newsletter so let me say a few words about all of them and uh, during my presentation of the uh, speakers please type on the comments of our translation which country are you from which company are you representing and uh, which kind of franchise do you have you can promote your franchise in the our conference Please type to the uh, comments to our translation uh, in, and uh, my colleagues will uh, bring this information and your questions and your comments to all the speakers in our platform that we use. Thank you very much in advance. Please type your name, type your country and type your company name, your franchise that you have. This is in exchange information. It's very uh, important for us. For, for me, it's uh, uh, a very big honor to represent this uh, global franchise conference and uh, unite all the uh, great speakers together. We have incredible experience that we have these days. And uh, first of all, right after me, uh, I will give a word to the uh, Yuri Mikhailnichenko. It's an international expert in the area. It's close to the 300 million people speaking in Russian. And uh, uh, there is a former USSR and uh, a Russian leader of the Russian uh, franchise association so you can see how it's developed in the in the emerging markets yes such as russia such as uh, belarusia such as kazakhstan and what kind of benefits you can have to develop your franchise in the such countries right after that uh, i will uh, give a word to the mr herman reisen he is uh, from germany and he's uh, representing the the most, the fastest growing the franchise industry in the logistic area, it's a deck company. And uh, guys, please uh, uh, type to the uh, our chat your contact details. We will give it to the comments, to the audience in our, uh, in our video uh, translation. So what we have right after that, Mr. Albert Kong is dedicated and the honored uh, leader of the franchise industry in uh, Singapore, in the center of the Southeast Asia, will 
tell you about the, how the franchise industry is now uh, surviving and developing in the Asia, in uh, China area, in uh, Indonesia, and in exactly in Singapore. So uh, Albert Kond is already with us. He will also see your comments. And I'm asking you again to people who just join us right now, type to the comments your name, your country, and uh, your franchise industry with all contact details. We uh, uh, welcome that you can promote your franchise during this conference. This is a new, unique opportunity for you. Thank you very much. Right after that, Felix Duvid is an experienced uh, expert from the Netherlands, from the center of Europe, will tell you the reality of the European market of the franchising. Europe it's a, one of the biggest economy in the world. You should develop your business in Europe for sure. And Felix will tell you what means the master franchising there in Europe and his vision about the franchising market in European uh, countries. Yes, that we have now. And right after Felix, it will be the speaker from the United States. It's Alex Depassier, it's our friend and uh, one of the best experts in the franchise industry. Also, he has experience in developing his own franchise network. And uh, now he's uh, doing the business, how to bring companies to, U to the US market. And uh, we really appreciate that uh, Alex can tell what is really happened now in the American market after the elections and how it's impact to the franchise industry. Thank you very much uh, for listening to us. Uh, uh, we are all united on that platform, uh, platform Global Franchise Conference. All this uh, uh, conference will be recorded by, by the video and you can see the records. And right now you can ask every questions right to the speakers. This is a unique opportunity to uh, direct call to the, every one of us and uh, you can tell uh, your opinion and ask your question directly to the speakers and we will unite and, and we will meet you to each other. Uh, this is our uh, obligations. Yes. For me personally, I have experience in the franchise industry more than 15 years. I sold more than 500 franchise concepts. Concept. One of my best experience. It's a, it's a huge uh, impression brand its name is expedition.com you can see it, we have a restaurant there and the, the retail store chain and also now i'm leading the international global franchise marketplace it's a b2b marketplace topfranchise.com where we unite more than 2000 different franchise and we focus on the emerging markets so one of the main point of this uh, conference it's how to develop in the emerging market markets where is a good demography when when you see there is a positive dynamic of the GDP, including China and India. So we have this uh, experience among all of our speakers and we will give awards to them. And uh, uh, the first one, the speaker from the emerging market, it's from Russia. It's uh, uh, Yuri Mikhailichenko, welcome you. You can uh, switch your camera and the microphone and uh, uh, say a few words to us. What's happened now in Russia, Yuri? <laughs> Hi, Vasil. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, as a member of our association is, uh, and as a partner who uh, develop our international relations, uh, Russia and uh, other countries. And uh, do you know that uh, for all of us uh, in franchise and other uh, sectors of economic uh, 2020 uh, year uh, was uh, difficult, uh, difficult for developing business, difficult for uh, promote franchise. Uh, nevertheless, uh, some sectors in Russia growing uh, rapidly, especially uh, sectors in uh, education and uh, another services. And uh, this year we expect in Russia and uh, CIS market, as you uh, mentioned uh, about uh, that, uh, uh, 300 uh, million people now is starting uh, working hard and uh, market uh, start uh, developing in this year uh, more rapidly. Uh, this year we expect uh, uh, growing at least uh, 20% uh, uh, per uh, 2020 year. And uh, we uh, absolutely, um, uh, absolutely trust uh, that uh, our market uh, uh, 
uh, stay uh, stable and uh, more attractive than on other markets uh, because uh, economic situation in Russia uh, nowadays uh, and this time uh, start uh, more stable. Uh, as you know, that's our restaurants, uh, fitness clubs, uh, some sectors uh, already uh, work in a standard uh, uh, situation that's uh, uh, open doors and uh, all of objects uh, working uh, not, not as in uh, 2019, but uh, better than uh, 2020. And uh, from this position, uh, we absolutely trust that uh, our market uh, will be attractive for uh, international investors. Uh, because uh, we already um, uh, do... sorry for my English. <laughs> I can help you, no problem. Maybe yes, be... you can say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's uh, uh, for English uh, speaking, I need a more practice. That's a 2020 was <laughs> is not good for, for this, uh, and uh, we expecting that uh, abroad investors uh, will. Uh, invest in Russian uh, companies and Russian markets uh, more uh, than uh, 2020 and more than 2019. Vasil. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you very much. So a few words. Uh, how do you think? Uh, what is the growth of the franchise industry in the Russia and the former USSR republics? Is it still growing or it's stable? Uh, now it's stable. Now it's stable. And uh, as you mentioned uh, already, that's uh, still growing in sectors of education, uh, in sector of uh, services, and in services of uh, constructions. Uh, yes, yeah. Thank yes. you. Uh, I have one more question. The last question. Yes, is uh, uh, is it safe to come to Russian market for the uh, to do in the franchise business? What you know about the uh, the few American brands, for example, or European that successfully, incredible successfully in the Russian market? Some kind of brands that you can mention that you can see in Moscow or in Russia. Uh, I absolutely agree that uh, uh, invest in Russia uh, safe. And as we uh, look at uh, our uh, American or European companies uh, who operate on Russian markets, uh, they uh, more uh, more profitable than a Russian company. Uh, as, uh, for example, uh, Burger King, McDonald's, uh, uh, Hilton, uh, or another uh, brands who. Uh, uh, show us it's a good growing and uh, stable and uh, developing uh, their business in Russia um, may be uh, better than Russian brands. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Yuri. We wish you a good health uh, to develop the franchise industry in Russia. Thank you for supporting us. It's very interesting to grow in the emerging markets. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, and we move to an, our next speaker. Uh, it's, uh, uh, to my opinion, it's uh, the one of the most fast-growing franchise company in the world. And we bring this company especially to tell you how to open more than 1,000 franchise uh, units in one year, in one very specific year. It is a COVID year. It is a quarantine everywhere. But this company is opened more than 1,000 units during the past uh, 2020 year. So, uh, Mr. Herman Ryzen, I just uh, uh, want to introduce you uh, and uh, please uh, say a few words about yourself, about your company and uh, the, this incredible experience of the past year, how you grow. Thank you. Yes, please switch on the microphone. Yes. Yes, please switch on the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but it's uh, still uh, very slow. Yes, very low so sound. Yes, please uh, uh, reconnect the microphone. <laughs> okay, I, I will try, sir. But uh, actually, uh, everything is 
everything is on. Uh, uh, I, I ask again, so is the quality of the audio transfer, is it good right now? Okay. Yes, yes, now we can hear you, but very, very low. Yes, maybe you can adjust your microphone to, to make it more louder a bit. Yes, it's okay, no problem. Yes, it's, it's it happened sometimes. Uh, give me a second. I yes, will... yes. Oh, make or oh, you can call a bit louder, okay? Yes, yes. Uh, give me a second. I will try to, to, to get on my earphones of the PC. Yes, yes, uh, no problem. Yes. Uh, while the Mr. Herman is adjusting the, the audio, uh, I just want to say to all uh, our uh, participants who join our conference today, please uh, write down on the comments uh, on our uh, video stream uh, your name, your country, and uh, your company, which kind of franchise you represent and on which kind of franchise you want to buy. It's very useful information. Start promoting your franchise immediately on our conference. Thank you very much. Yes, we can continue. Great, perfect. So I hope now the audio quality is much more higher. Yes, great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Sometimes it's so curious about digital data, right? It's, uh, okay, great. Uh, I think. Okay, is, is it, uh, I would like to share a presentation with you. Is that okay? Yes, great, thank you. Perfect. So just give me one more second. Here we go. Yes, we can so. see you well. Just give me a second, yes. So now you should see it uh, over the whole screen. Yes. Okay, so thanks a lot. Sorry for this uh, circumstances. Um, dear participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the introduction, Vasil. Uh, yes, great. So CREC is most probably known by uh, a big number of participants who are acquainted with the Russian market and with the Russian e-commerce and logistics providers. But uh, in general, I would love to present some numbers which I think we can be proud of. So we are uh, only since 21 years on the Russian market. And I mean, only, with only I, I mean, it's quite a short period for development of such a uh, huge and sustainable comprehensive business. And by that time, we've reached uh, almost 3,000 offices, uh, mostly in Russia, but now growing and uh, really expensively growing all over the world. We will come later to the map. Uh, we have... Uh, 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 more than 20,000 employees, and we have a total coverage in Russia. So that means there's no uh, area where we cannot uh, provide our services and deliver parcels, but also pick up parcels. And you see, we're already available in 20 countries, which sounds, sounds maybe a lot, but from our point of view, it's just the beginning, right? So uh, the end, uh, there should be a number which is almost 200. Uh, this is our strategic goal. So, and here you can see our coverage uh, globally. You really see that the whole business is concentrated on Russia till now, but we are already developing. We have opened our branches in China, Kazakhstan, and now since last year in Europe, from where we will conduct our development uh, over the whole world, and especially conduct and support the work of, of our franchisees. This is especially interesting for us, but also for our franchisees, because our whole concept is based on the idea that we are growing together in partnership. That means it's not just that our franchisees are providing operations, they're taking parcel scan uh, scanning, consolidating and giving away. No, every single participant in our franchise network is able to realize sales and to grow by sales. That means we're not just outsourcing uh, the operations uh, through the support of our franchisees, but we are also sharing the possibility to gain new customers and therefore to get the margin through these sales on our products. I think this is something which is quite unique in our industry, in our branch, because if you're getting our franchisee, you will get the possibility to sell our products all over the world. So that means you can have just one point where you realize operations. It doesn't matter if it's in Germany, US, if it's in Brazil, if it's China. 
But then you can develop your sales capacities and get amazing uh, growth and profits on that. And uh, why is that pro prosperous and why is that a promise which is interesting? You can see uh, this is uh, uh, results done by Apple Research. It's an independent marketing research company. And you see that the Russian Post, which is the Russian uh, mail service, official state service, is uh, obviously our biggest and most important competitor, which is great because uh, it's typical for our industry that the official uh, post companies have the biggest market share. But you can see that in terms of the awareness of our customers, we really have great numbers uh, in all the categories. If it's top of mind questions or spontaneous replies, or if it's even prompted selection possibilities. And what you can see on the right side, this is the validation of the asked people, of the interviewed people regarding their per, per perspective uh, on the particular criteria. And the darker green it is, the better it is. And uh, you can see that in this category, CDEC is quite well. And we are very focusing the other parts where we are good but not very, very dark green for the next development. You can see some customers, uh, this uh, typical name dropping, I think is quite interesting to uh, really uh, give you a profound understanding of the services and of the quality, because otherwise these companies wouldn't work with us. So maybe some words to the global e-commerce market uh, development, because it's quite important uh, to understand before potential interest, potential candidate decide to invest in uh, uh, purchasing a franchise license uh, of CDEC. Sure, I mean, you, can, you have seen a lot of these numbers, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and uh, China, US are the biggest market. But then following by UK, Germany, and we have Russia, uh, and so on, and so on. And uh, the only market we're not pre presented uh, on right now is Brazil, but we're working on that already. The other markets are already covered by our presence. So we can provide services on these markets and we can make our franchisee grow selling products on these markets. Uh, the next question is for sure, what's about the dynamic? What about e-commerce generally? Uh, yes, we have forecasted numbers from 2020 and they differ depending on the experts who are pro providing information. But the general overall understanding is that uh, especially after the pandemic this year, the e-commerce is growing. A lot of companies, even who have uh, provided only offline sales, have now decided to go online to sales, uh, to, to, to realize sales online. And that is definitely a good base for our uh, future development. So now to the uh, basic uh, topic we're, to uh, we're speaking about here. So if you are our franchise partner, uh, you are dealing with the operations, but as I mentioned, the products and services we sell, this is uh, most probably the focus for you in order to grow and to get economically uh, successful. And usually we divide our product by type and the most common and understood types are B2C. This is a classical e-commerce business when an online shop uh, is selling products to a uh, to, to, to final customer. C2C, this is a uh, C2C uh, customer to customer market. That means I would like to send something to my friend. It's a personal, uh, business, uh, personal case. I just go there, deliver my package and it goes to my friend. But we also have B2B. This is basically mostly about documents, but also goods, especially in cross-border perspective. When we're talking about sending goods from, from Europe, for example, to CIS countries. Uh, in, we're generally talking about different aspects of the uh, of speed and cost. And here we have uh, usually Avia, which is uh, mostly express sending. We have road, which is usually uh, uh, less costly, it's cheaper, but takes some more days. And sometimes we even have sea operation. Not so much yet, but it's coming. And of course, if you start as a franchise partner, Mostly, your encounter operations and potential customers are the first focus. Since we come from Russia and, and from the Russian market, we are well developed there. You've seen it with a lot of green, dark green fields. Uh, and of, for sure, about the history and the language and the common culture, it's also CIS. So this is usually the second focus. But in the same way, we start to develop business, which is gl really global cross-border business, which means independent from Russia. 
So uh, usually those are uh, directions like China, Europe, Europe, uh, Middle East, but also China, US, US, Europe, and uh, South America uh, and Europe. So what we provide, we give all our franchisees a ready, ready to use infrastructure, right? We are, uh, so the invest in terms of tools and systems, it, it, it's not there, right? So you just need your office and your equipment usually and your stuff you, you, you start to work with. We permanently work on a high level of automatization and improve it. Uh, we are training our franchisees. We usually have one week initial training. And later on, we provide permanently additional seminars and trainings on topics like sales, customer qualifications, our product, and things like that. And for sure, we deliver you personal support. It's marketing support in order to understand how you can develop your business in this framework of CDEC franchise. But it's also an individual support manager for each of our franchisees. So every time you will have a question, you have an idea and want to understand how to position it within your, our company, your personal manager will always be the link to the rest of the company and will support and help. We have kind of standards for our offices, which is not a, a high level uh, rocket science, right? But in, usually it looks like that. So we have this customer area where everything has to be structured, clear and, and clean. And we have a small storage where we can uh, store the parcels of our customers, which is quite near available, but at the same time is covered. So the customer is not really looking on the operation area. And for sure, in order to provide a uh, real good service to our customers, we have a lot of instruments, a lot of tools uh, not about surveillance of the productivity or control, it's not about controlling our franchise partners, but we have instruments and methods installed which take responsibility from our partners because uh, every critical situation, every critical process and interaction with the final customers is documented and that leads to a high level of satisfaction on the side of our customers, but also on the side of our franchisees and our partners. That's basically all. Uh, we have a very nice, interesting, and very uh, dynamic colleague, uh, colleague uh, who is Konstantin Reisner. He is responsible for our international franchise sales. So uh, later on, you will get this presentation, uh, presentation. And if you are interested or have additional questions, please do not hesitate and get directly in contact with Konstantin. He will be very lucky and satisfied to provide you all the information you require. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Mr. Herman. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, let me uh, ask you a few questions, okay? Uh, uh, just a bit. Uh, so, is it real that uh, you opened more than 1,000 uh, or almost 1,000 units in the past year? What is, uh, what's happening? <laughs> Why did you do this? <laughs> Yes, that's right. It's a really crazy number because growth is always, firstly, appreciated as positive, but one should not uh, forget that growth means you have to realize your operative uh, possibilities and ability to deal with this growth. But uh, from our point of view, uh, there are two special factors which uh, led us to this, this success. A, this is really the pandemic, right? So the uh, need of e-commerce deliveries is uh, really, has really grown last year and in, 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 in Russia for sure. But on the other side, this is the, uh, also the success of our last years. So we have grown in the main markets, uh, in the main areas where people live in Russia. And especially last year, we have focused the deep regions where the coverage still there has not been that high, right? But still, we have a lot of people who live there in Russia. So that means in the first step where the economics are prior, uh, priority one number, we're focused really the big clusters. But last year, we focused the development in the deep region. And that led also to a big number of new uh, offices we have opened. Okay, great. So uh, what, what kind of markets, which markets are you focusing on the next this year, 2021? Which markets except... Uh, former USSR, Russia, you are focusing now, where you want to develop and see the potential. It's very important for our audience to, to uh, see you. What do you thinking about the other markets? Yes. 
So basically, it's uh, uh, when, when we talk about further focused development, it's for sure China and uh, USA, because these are really global, strong markets with a lot of e-commerce. And uh, we are already presented there. But for example, in US, we just have two offices open, which for now cover the requirements of the customers, but there is really a place to grow, right? Okay. And on the other side, we have China with a lot of offices uh, uh, open, but the connection between China and markets like Europe and US, it's not developed as we would love to have it. So the, the focus is on that for sure. Okay. In terms of new markets, we're focusing Europe very much. Uh, I mean, we have almost 40 countries here, uh, a lot of different cultures and a lot of specialities in terms of uh, uh, e-commerce. Uh, and therefore, we are focusing this, the, this region in terms of very new market openings. So for now, we are working on, for example, on Spain, on France, on Israel. Uh, and uh, just some weeks ago, we have opened Bulgaria. Uh, and this is additionally to the markets we already had uh, running, for example, UK, Germany, Poland, Italy. Okay. So we have quite high numbers we would like to realize, but what we see now that the markets is quite uh, uh, high, has quite the high dynamic. So we decided to follow two main vectors. The one is strategic focusing, but the other one is this opportunistic approach. So if one of our listeners, participants, is interesting to get our friends to become our franchise partner in a market we have not opened yet, we will definitely look at this candidate and the opportunity and together, together with the candidate, develop an approach to open this market despite our maybe different focus. Okay, good. Thank you very much for your presentation. I wish you good luck to open in the uh, more than one unit per day, <laughs> as, I, as I understand. And uh, we are moving now to Asia from Europe, from the Germany. We are moving now to Asia and uh, uh, let's see the Mr. Albert Kong. And I would like to ask uh, Mr. Albert to switch on uh, the camera and the microphone and uh, switch on the presentation. We're really happy to see you, Mr. Albert. How are you doing today? <laughs> Great. I, I saw, I'm so happy to see you. Yes. Let's check the audio and, uh, and let's start. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, for money, privet. Huh? <laughs> so uh, good day to uh, friends from uh, other parts of the world that uh, don't speak Russian. Uh, okay. So let me uh, try to see if I'm allowed to share screen. No, uh, I think Kira, you have to let me share screen. Hmm. Yes, uh, we should uh, allow to Mr. Albert to share the screen. Yes. Great. Yes. And uh, uh, in a few seconds, we will see the presentation. Yes, let's uh, uh, let's make the presentation. Right. I'm, I'm still waiting to share my rep, uh, my PPT. Um, uh, Kira, have you have you activated that? Yes, yes, we will, we will activate it right now. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, actually, it, it will take a few seconds uh, more. Uh, let's start. I, I just uh, ask uh, uh, you the, the normal, yes, uh, questions. Yes. While okay, we are go ahead. Yeah. on the, the presentation, it's for sure you will get it. Uh, uh, and uh, let's uh, uh, say uh, what's happening now in Singapore. It's just uh, like humans, what you feel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are quite fortunate. I mean, we still get to, uh, you know, almost every other day I, I go for lunch meetings with my friends, you know, and uh, dinner. So life is quite normal, except that we all wear our mask before the food is put in front of us. Um, and we keep the social distance, but uh, the the feeling is uh, like you know, it, it's just a mask, and and that people are more cautious. They wash their hands more, uh, you know. And I still I just came from a meeting before this meeting. I see, I see. Yeah, uh, so we 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 are very fortunate. I think uh, you know, uh, people are all behaving themselves. Nobody is shouting about 
freedom, you know, and and not wanting to put on the mask. <laughs> so we okay. are quite we are quite lucky, yeah. Yes. So do you start yes. uh, using the vaccine every uh, in the people? Yes, yes, we 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 have begun all the vaccination. Uh, my turn will not be so soon. Uh, they they give all the frontliners and people you know in the medical field and people you know facing the public you know so uh, and then and then the elderly. Uh, I'm only 65, so uh, I'm still too young. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. But I think my turn will come probably in a few weeks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, Mr. Albert, let's try again to switch on the presentation. I will ask my colleagues uh, uh, to let you this. No, it, it still shows that uh, the host has disabled participant screen sharing, so I, I can't share. Yeah, 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 we will do this. Uh, or, okay. uh, by the way, you can send it uh, to the uh, uh, organizers, yes, uh, to the colleagues that uh, you have, and uh, we can switch it on. Mm, okay. Uh, let's see. Because when I tried it out yesterday with Kira, it worked perfectly. No problem at all. So I, I'm just okay, wondering okay. what's happening. Uh, you can uh, you can try again. Yes. Uh, okay. let, let, take let the again. permission yeah. and uh, try again to switch on the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Strange. 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 Let me see. Let me try myself and. Uh, Hmm. Um. Right. Um. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Organizers is uh, shared the rights to the presentation, or we can give you the rights for the like uh, organizers now. Yes, please. Yes, please. I'll try yes. again. Mm, uh, no, it, it yeah, yeah, we will show. do this uh, uh, right now. Yes. Mm, yeah, let's okay. talk uh, while the, we have this uh, presentation. Uh, the few words, yes, about your company. Uh, could you please tell uh, about your experience? Yes, and uh, uh, by the way, we will uh, switch on the presentation. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, I have been doing franchise consulting in the whole of Asia for 32 years. And I've had the privilege of uh, representing Singapore at the World Franchise Council uh, for 30 years. Now, uh, my team and I, we have built a lot of franchise systems all over Asia. Uh, by last count, we have done projects in 11 countries. And we have also, like you, uh, done a lot of brokerages, meaning uh, bringing franchises from one country to another. And the other thing that I think uh, you might be aware is that I published the Asia Franchise Magazine uh, is into its 27th year, launched by the Singapore Trade Development Board 27 years ago. Uh, it's in English and it's in Mandarin because a lot of the Chinese people in Asia, all over Asia, they, they can read Mandarin, yeah? So, um, and we have also been very busy, uh, in, well, in spite of all the franchise shows uh, going by uh, virtual instead of uh, physical shows, we have done a lot of uh, what we call matchmaking uh, sessions uh, via Zoom. Uh, so we have done that with the Taiwanese Franchise Association. You know, uh, we have also done that for uh, companies from Korea. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's very interesting. Uh, I, in my slide, I will share about, you know, uh, all the shows that are still going to happen. Some are still going to do virtually, uh, but the, the, the bolder ones are still in... Uh, Vietnam and in Taiwan. Uh, in Singapore, uh, if everything goes well, we will do a hybrid show, meaning uh, if for Singapore-based companies, they will have their physical franchise exhibition booths. For overseas uh, brands, franchise brands that cannot come physically, they will have the virtual ones. 
so that visitors to the show can have both, meaning visit physical booths and visit virtual booths. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm very bullish about franchising because uh, even Pakistan, you know, and even Mongolia, and uh, even Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar. Although Myanmar is now going through a difficult time because yes. of the yes. political uh, instability, but people are still very interested, you know, in franchises from abroad. Uh, not surprising though, because you and I are human beings and we like to have more choices. Uh, we feel, uh, you know, that our life is richer because we have uh, not just local brands, local restaurants, local childcare, but we also have overseas brands to choose from, you know. Ah, good. Now I can see that I can go in. Beautiful. Okay. Yes. So let's, let's get down to the presentation. <laughs> yeah. Like it. Like it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. Very good. So this is just to show Vasil your company's logo and my company's logo, yeah? Now, very quickly, uh, I think all of us are still, you know, uh, looking at, uh, you know, how we can uh, handle the present situation, which is the pandemic. So everybody is very cautious about health and, and hygiene, yeah? And about safe distancing, yeah? Now, in ASEAN, uh, the, according to the uh, uh, Asian Development Bank, you know, the entire ASEAN nation of 10 countries, uh, very naturally because of the pandemic, the growth will be lowered to 5.2%. Not a lot uh, as per what they wanted uh, or what they projected earlier on as 6.2%, but it's still growth, yeah? And, uh, you know, the, every country is talking about containment me measures. Just as an example, in Singapore, the government has come up with a lot of, uh, you know, funding for small and medium-sized enterprises. And it all revolves around cash flow, costs, you know, meaning like, you know, rental costs, labor costs, and credit. Because, you know, uh, it's all about keeping uh, companies alive and getting them through this difficult time, yeah? So uh, as what I mentioned earlier, these are just two examples uh, that uh, face uh, double whammies because other than the pandemic, in Myanmar, there's a coup and you know there's instability. And in many countries in Southeast Asia, uh, just as in Europe and in America, you know, uh, the, due to the pandemic, uh, the economy has been affected, right? Now, the national franchise associations uh, in many parts of Asia, they will still do their franchise show. So in chronological order, meaning, you know, month by month uh, from January to December, you know, we have Hong Kong, we have Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Philippines, you know, and then you have China and China's several cities, you know, starting with Beijing, followed by Malaysia, Thailand, and then China again in Shanghai, and then Indonesia, then Singapore, and then Vietnam, and then finally end the year with China again in Guangzhou. So the shows are still going to take place because people are still very inter interested in franchising. And many of you in the audience, uh, including Vasil, you will agree that, you know, when people lose their job, when people are put on very long furloughs, they begin to think about whether they should become entrepreneurs. And one very safe way to become an entrepreneur is through franchising. So franchising is actually, you know, a very good way out for many people who are losing their job or who has been asked to, you know, go on long leave, put on long furlough because their company has no business, right? So on top of that, like I mentioned earlier, uh, lots of matchmaking sessions are still being organized, you know, and the governments, including Singapore government, are, they are still supporting franchising. And I have said in many of my presentations, just to give you an, an, an example, if you were a company and you want to franchise in Singapore, and you were to look for Asia-wide franchise consultants, my company, 
And if you qualify, 80% of my fees will be paid by the government. You know, so you see how real the support is. And when you want to go to overseas to exhibit in a franchise show, you know, your uh, exhibition booth fees and your marketing materials for that show can also be subsidized. And if you want to do a market survey, you know, you want to get your franchise agreement localized, translated, again, the government will subsidize. So, you know, Franchising is actually uh, something positive in many governments' eyes, you know. So I'm very, very bullish and optimistic about franchising. Now, next. So these are just some examples that's happening in Singapore. We make use of the pandemic to do a lot of webinars. So these are some of them, you know. You can see my handsome face in this slide, yeah. And uh, this is just a general... Uh, common sense graph that during this period, you'll find that those that do a lot better and still employ people are the likes of supermarkets, you know, uh, the likes of those who are doing health and personal care. Whereas those that are, you know, in clothing and furniture and electronics, they don't do so well because people have to prioritize their spending. You know, their, their money is getting lesser because the economy is bad. They don't get the pay rise, you know, and generally, you know, uh, some people are put on furlough. So, so the family income and personal income, have, you know, they have dropped. So people spend on essentials, you know, yeah. Okay, so very quickly, I just want to share uh, 10 trends that are applicable both for uh, food and beverage and even for retail. So one will be transparency. I think, uh, you know, uh, in Innova Market, they did a survey uh, and they found that 60% of the people surveyed, they, they want to know more about where goods are coming from. So, you know, the blockchain technology plays a very important part. People want to know, okay, if I'm eating your beef, is this beef, you know, from a farm that is, you know, uh, you know, uh, environmentally uh, responsible? Do they feed the cow with good grains, you know, and not nonsense, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so they want transparency. They don't want to be fed, you know, donkey meat, you know, as if it is beef, right? You know, so which can be a problem. And then the next one is uh, people, uh, the, the people are so conscious about the health and diet, you know, and sustainability and taste uh, the plant-based food is now become very trendy. So I'm sure we have all heard about impossible food and many other food, food manufacturers using, you know, soy and other vegetables to make imitation meat, you know. Then the next trend will be uh, this getting personal. You know, people want to uh, have uh, their restaurants and their retailers know what they want. They want uh, people to tailor, you know, uh, their needs, you know, uh, because maybe of beliefs and of, of their lifestyle, you know. So getting personal and therefore uh, doing data analytics, making use of IT, making use of AI will be very important. Uh, next will be omni-channel eating. Uh, people want more choices. They, they, they want to eat when they want, where they want. It's the same with buying clothes, you know. So people want more choices. So this omni-channel thing will apply to both eating and even shopping for, for clothing. And the other thing which is related to other points will be full immunity. You know, people even want to uh, take a food that has been uh, boosted by vitamins, you know, uh, so that they, you know, their nutrition uh, is, is more complete so that they can get better immunity against future viruses, you know. So uh, related to this will be what we call the nu nutrition hacking, yeah. Uh, people like uh, to have food that is uh, loaded with vitamins and protein, again, to, to support their immune system. Uh, the next point is the less humans part, which is, uh, you know, people will understand that they cannot go back to the old past where they can go for buffets and they share 
platters of food. You know, people might have to use QR codes to order food. They will see that uh, there will be Pepsi glass that divide them from even their girlfriends or wives. So it, the human touch will be lesser. You know, even pizza deliverer people, you know, they, 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 when they deliver the food, they, they would like to, you know, put it on a platform or on the floor if it's clean and not have to touch the human being, the customer, you know. So it will be less human. And then the other thing is less waste. I think, uh, you know, people realize that a lot of the problems, including probably also the virus, is caused by the climate change. You know, uh, the climate change and the warming of the earth, uh, for all you know, is causing uh, more variants, you know, more diseases. So uh, people are conscious. People want to live for a higher purpose. They want to see less waste. They don't want to patronize companies, whether they're in food or fashion or education, that are not environmentally friendly, you know. Uh, and then there's this food for mood thing. Uh, recently, I read reports about some countries actually allowing cannabis to be, you know, put in drinks and food. You know, and of course, uh, in Singapore, if you have uh, certain grams of, uh, you know, marijuana, you hang. It's a death sentence, you know. So, and we will not allow cannabis uh, in any form, you know, uh, even if it's very little, very small trace. Uh, but uh, pe people are looking for food that will boost their mood, you know, uh, make them happier, uh, make them sleep better, uh, make them feel less depressed. Uh, we are seeing that. Uh, we are seeing that the food manufacturers are trying to not just put vitamins, but also enhancers that will boost a certain kind of mood, you know. Yeah. And then finally, uh, you know, even for uh, something as simple as coffee, uh, you will have all sorts of coffee. People are experimenting, you know, putting uh, coffee in yogurt, coffee in energy bars, coffee in alcohol coffee in smoothies and granola bars. So what I'm saying is, you know, people want more choices. People want to see, you know, how inventive you are, but at the same time, you know, not spoiling or harming my health, you know. So it's very interesting. Now, uh, just an example, uh, because of, for those of you who know the Chinese custom, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, during Chinese New Year, they like to gather around, you know, tables and tables of food. So one of the first food to eat is, uh, is what we call yu sheng, which is uh, raw fish with uh, salad, you know, and everybody will take their chopsticks and they will just toss it high up and then, you know, and then they all fall back on the plate and everybody gets it. But because now of the pandemic, uh, now a lot of restaurants, including... Uh, Genki Sushi, which is a, 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 a sushi franchise from Japan, they actually came up with an individual one-pack yusen so that people don't have to share from the same platter so that, you know, the saliva from people will not be mixed and therefore cause, you know, infection, you know. So this is, uh, this is good thinking. This is actually knowing how to ride on the festive season which is the, the Lunar New Year, and knowing that people still want to have their yeason and they can still do it individually. So this is good thinking. And for uh, uh, this uh, Tong Ren Tang, which is a very huge uh, Chinese medicine uh, uh, um, hall, uh, cup, uh, which is from China, they are even going into the coffee cafe market. You know, So again, they are thinking of the box because they realize that Starbucks and many coffee chains have entered China and they're doing very well. So they thought to themselves, why can't a Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine business also go into coffee business, you know, and they can infuse the coffee with Chinese herbs and help boost the immunity of uh, their customers. So I think this is also good thinking. Okay, so I will, uh, because of the time, I will uh, just use two more slides and I, I will finish. So in my many um, 
in the many, many uh, presentations I've done around the world, I've spoken, I've spoken in 46 nations. And in the last 32 years, I've spoken maybe at least 300 times. But I like to end with the letter C. You know, if you are in franchising, you always use the letter C and say, okay, is my concept something that will work in the country I want to go to? You know, uh, will, will there be a market? Is it, you know, is it a food that is offensive to the people's religion over there? You know, the consumers, you know, how big is the consumer base? You know, what's their spending power? You know, uh, you know, is, uh, if, if I were to do it there, you know, uh, how much cash will be needed by the franchisee there, you know, uh, for, uh, and how am I going to price my franchise so that my franchisee will have a profitable business, you know, then there are the big things like the culture, the political environment, you know, the economic environment, you know, the social thinking, you know, the technology there, you know, like in some countries during a political crisis, you have no access to internet, you know? So uh, if, if you are very uh, 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 IT-based, then your, your business might be affected, you know? And then you have to think about the copycats there, you know? And also the contract, you know, uh, whether your IP, uh, you know, your intellectual property can be registered there and whether the government there, uh, you know, what kind of control? Do they only look at contracts in their local language? You know, is... Uh, if you go into a joint venture, what is the maximum percentage that you can hold? All these things have to be considered. So a lot of C's. Another C will be communication. You know, if your if your your name in your own local language may sound very nice, but when you go to another country, it may sound like a bad word, you know, or a vulgar word. Worse still, right? And I've shared this even about Subway's Chinese name, you know, and and many people were shocked, you know. Uh, so, and then finally, you really have to look at whether your candidate is the right candidate, you know, uh, in terms of whether, you know, they, they really know the market and whether they are committed to the market. So, these are the C's that I think all franchisors have to, have to consider before they go to any country. Okay, and finally, uh, the piece of marketing must be very, very important, you know, uh, and other than the product, the price, and where you locate your business, you must also look at the packaging, you know, like, for example, you know, uh, it is said that in Chinese majority countries, red is, uh, is uh, red color is a, a very welcome color. Whereas in other countries, like, uh, you know, in Muslim countries, green is very popular, you know, etc, etc. Yeah, so I will not go further, uh, because I don't think I have a lot of time left. Uh, and I want to end by saying this, you know, what is very important is adaptation. You know, you, you need to adapt. Uh, you, you can't just say that, oh, look, I'm McDonald's and McDonald's can only sell, sell beef. So if you go to a country like India, where, you know, most people are Hindus and they don't take beef, then you have no business. But McDonald's went to India, they adapted. Their, their patty is a, is a vegetarian patty, you know, and they adjusted the pricing. So they adapt, yeah? So you adapt to everything if you really want to do business there. But like I said, most important of all, choose the right partner who really knows the market. And so I will end my presentation. This is just a slide about uh, my team members uh, in Singapore and our background. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, but, thank you very yeah. much, Mr. Albert. Yes, thank you. Stay healthy. Hope to see you in Singapore. Yes, and uh, yes. yeah, it's really, uh, we really appreciate that you have time to speak to our international audience. Uh, and uh, we now move into Europe. Uh, stay with us, please. Uh, yes, you can switch off your uh, presentation and, uh, and the camera, and uh, we will give a word uh, to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Felix. Uh, Duit is uh, from the Netherlands and uh, uh, Felix is uh, uh, our partner and uh, the one of the top experts in the uh, uh, franchise industry and the real estate, in, in, real estate industry in uh, Europe. And uh, Felix, uh, now uh, we're listening to you what's happening in Europe now in the franchise industry. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh... Okay, perfect. I'm, uh, I'm doing well, but I tell a little bit more in my presentation. Uh, shall I switch uh, to my presentation? Yes, let's switch on. Let me go one moment. You can start demonstration, right? Do you, uh, do you get it? Yes. Okay, my presentation, I gave it the title, uh, Franchise in Europe during and after the pandemic. Um, let me uh, tell me, uh, my name is uh, Felix De Witt. Uh, I'm married, I have three kids, and since uh, one year and a half, I have a grandson. I started my career in 1978 as an officer in the Royal Dutch Army, so I can say proud as I am that I'm a veteran. Then I uh, worked as a real estate agent. Um, and uh, finally, I made a uh, very good uh, decision in my life uh, to join an incredible uh, real estate company, the top of the world, it's named Remax. I was a master franchisee for the Netherlands. And uh, when I uh, left the company in 2009, I decided to build my business in franchise development consultancy and sales. I uh, live in a very small country, the Netherlands. It's a very beautiful country. Most of the, of the attendees today, they know it for sure. They know uh, our country from the windmills and the tulips. And when I say Amsterdam, you know about the red light area and the channels there. I started uh, Remax. Uh, Remax is an uh, international uh, brand in the real estate industry, founded in 1974 in uh, the USA. I was country number 24 when I joined in 1998. And at this moment, this company is existing in more than 130 countries uh, globally. Why I started Remax? First of all, I was in the real estate industry and I figured out that the real industry, industry was not working the way I liked it. I wanted to change the industry. I wanted as a business owner to have the opportunity to build something for myself, but not by myself. And why I choose for, Rem for Remax? Because I'm a winner and I always like to join the best. That's the reason. I choose for the McDonald's in the real estate industry. I built uh, the network uh, together with a partner from uh, 1998 till 2009. We had an incredible growth, a incredible expansion. We sold more than uh, 150 uh, franchises in that uh, short period of time. And you see in 2008, 2009, we had a crisis in the real estate industry. We dropped down a little bit. After that, when I sold my company, I decided uh, to build a uh, franchise uh, consultancy company uh, where we have some expertise. I can say myself, I was a franchise owner for a long period of time. So I know exactly what my customers expect uh, to build their brand. Uh, we are recognized and we have capabilities. Uh, our services, we, I always say to people, to build a big business, you need a small focus. Uh, I made a big mistake myself when I was a master franchise owner. I want to do everything by myself. I want to do the marketing, the technology, the franchise sales. And the lesson I've learned out of it, to build a big business, you need a small focus. So concentrate on your business and find the right professional people to support you to make the growth possible. I see my personal vision, and we are in a terrible situation at the moment, and I want to see it very positive. I see a good franchise organization work exactly like a virus, but then in a positive sense. Someone gets infected with it, then it affects the other, and if everyone does, does their job well, transmission goes very fast. When you sell a lot of franchises, your network will grow and franchise becomes a treat to the competition. This is what I was using a long time ago before the pandemic. When I was selling franchises, I always used this expression to motivate people to join our network. 
What we in right now in Europe, that's actually not an easy situation. I explain you later. You can see uh, globally uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, infection is uh, dramatically at the moment. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, you see, uh, besides of uh, the USA, uh, Europe is uh, infected uh, very, uh, very much uh, at the moment. The situation because of COVID-19 in my country at the moment, we have totally locked down most of the European countries. In my country, the Netherlands, everything is locked. Most companies are closed. Sport facilities are closed as well. Most schools are closed. We are even in my country, and that was a really tough decision from our government. We are on an evening clock, a curfew, and that is not easy, but this week they postponed our lockdown till the 2nd of March. When you want to have a visitor at your home, you are not allowed to uh, uh, invite your parents, only your mother or your father. You cannot invite all your kids. You are allowed only one visitor in your home. And back to the business, we have a governmental contribution to wage costs. Our government, uh, is helping uh, business owners to survive this crisis because they want to see the unemployment rising very much. And they even uh, invested a lot of uh, billions for a fixed cost allowance in the business. The situation in the franchise industry is uh, at this moment, uh, Europe has one of the most developed franchise industry of the world. That is since many, many years. And many franchisors expand their brands across Europe by recruiting masters. They uh, work in uh, the form of a master franchise. That's very good for the management of, uh, the, of the franchise brand. And that's very good for um, uh, expanding uh, abroad. When you are a USA, as you go back to Remax. Remax was founded in the USA. They sold masters all over the world. And that's the reason they are uh, rolling out globally. Many franchisors have used the service of a Europe-based franchise consulting company. They know the culture. They know the atmosphere. They know to find the people, etc. Before COVID-19, every year we had an exponential growth in the franchise industry. For example, the Netherlands in 2019, we had around 950 franchise brands with gross revenues over 80, 38 uh, billion. So the GDP, the gross uh, domestic uh, product, is 8, 12 billion. That means that franchise is very important for the industry. It's 5% of the GDP. And since COVID-19 in 2020, we have an economic downturn in all the businesses. So also in the franchise industry, but there are a lot of benefits that franchises can, uh, can survive. What were the best cases actually in 2020? that I see still the company that I invested uh, 12 years of my life is still growing uh, worldwide. And that one of the uh, Russian franchisors that my company supported in 2012 became a publicity, publicity traded company. That's always good when you see that you invested your time, your effort and your money in some, uh, in some activities. And you see after so many years, that is still growing. And these were the best cases in 2020 that I always used in my presentation to potential customers. And private and business-wise, the ever best case that happened in 2020 is the development of more COVID-19 vaccines. This will change uh, our life in private. I just explained to you what's going on in my country at the moment. I explained a bit what's going on in the business because of the vaccination at the moment. For sure, I'm totally uh, uh, um, satisfied that we will go back to a normal life as we had before. 
I wrote a book last week and I found a nice expression. If you can film an idea in your mind, follow that film ID shot for shot, scene for scene, that ID is worth making from Greg Map. This was a very good statement. Probably some of the attendees can do something with this uh, statement. The trends development in franchise 2021, what I expected, the market for new franchise development around Europe will remain robust and strong. That will never change. There are excellent reasons to start a business during the down economy. Existing companies will franchise their business. Yes, it's a great time for many entrepreneurs dream. And you have to realize that smart investors always make money, not excuses. Sorry to drink a little bit. What are the reasons to start a business during a down uh, economy? You have to realize that raw materials and goods are much cheaper. A startup can save sometimes over 75% when business sells off their items and assets during a recession. That's a good reason to start a business. The number of competitors is down. Since there are obviously, obviously a less amount of startups during a bad economy, it makes a lot of uh, sense to start a business that solves a problem and has the adequate funds to help it push through the time that comes, to the tough times that will come. People are always looking to save money. As a rule, when to spend next to nothing in a bad economy, the fact is their purchasing power, income, and maybe even their jobs have been affected. So they return are in no financial mood to let go of cash for just anything. You can save a bundle on interest. You have to realize that uh, the banks uh, have to uh, survive after this uh, crisis as well. Uh, actually, the interest rate is very low in uh, Europe at the moment, but I think it will stabilize to get back in the business. And last but not least, people are always looking for innovation. During the bad economy, people are looking for a business or a service that can solve their problems. Startups too are looking for innovative business solutions that don't just make their overall operation easier, but also lowers their expenditures. Existing companies will franchise their business. I see this as, an, uh, as a benefit uh, as well. There are lower costs. Unlike employees, franchisees make an initial payment in return for becoming a part of your business and then they continue to pay a percentage of their revenue throughout the duration of the franchise agreement. Simpler management. Franchisees are themselves uh, responsible for the day-to-day -day running of their business uh, units and they must do this actively in accordance with the franchise agreements and operations manual. As franchisees have invested their own hard-earned money, they do not uh, require uh, the detailed level of management which would be needed for employees. I see coming up a faster expansion a better market penetration. There will be a greater commitment. Franchisees have invested in their business and know that they can benefit directly from its success. Logically, for that reason, their commitment will be much greater than that of employees. Less recruitment. On purchasing the franchise, the franchisees are really taking a decision, decision to stick with their chosen business for the long term. And last but not least, also in this situation, international potential. Using a system called master franchising, people can quickly and simply replicate the whole of uh, the model, their model that they developed in other countries. My suggestion to the audience, stay focused. 
the pandemic won't change the franchise industry. Many franchisees will join. This is an experience over the last 50 years that after a crisis, people that are an existing business, they will find solutions to survive the next crisis. And you can say what you want when you see in my country that franchising is 5% of the GDP that you see the importance. And as an existing franchisor, it's important that you show leadership to your network. You have to realize that your franchisees in your system are your most important assets. So take care for them, especially at this incredible tough time. I thank you very much for your attendance. You have my uh, contact details. Uh, when you need some support, I'm very uh, uh, thankful to help you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Felix. <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy to see you. Uh, could you please tell me uh, and to our audience uh, the only one question? Uh, how you compare this crisis that uh, we have now compared to the previous crises that you survived and your companies? <laughs> Is it really tough or it's not so tough as before? Um... I see this crisis is less tough than before. When I went to uh, 1998 and I was in the real estate business and there was a real estate uh, crisis, it was really hard to survive because as a franchisor, you have to manage all your franchisees. Your franchisees don't do business, they run out of money. But what I see now, this is really, I see this as a private crisis. When you have a lockdown, and you have an evening clock, then you cannot leave your house after nine. That's really tough. It's really tough for young people, but for business people, we can do a lot with the internet, with video conferencing. I can contact with my clients on a daily basis. When I'm a franchisor, I can speak to my franchise owners on a daily basis by a video, by a Zoom conference. And I think this crisis, that's the main answer on your question, is less tough than different, especially in business life. In private, uh, I have an 85-year young mother, and she told me uh, it's a little bit like uh, the Second World War, because I feel very lonely. I don't see my kids, I don't see my grandkids, and I can really imagine. So yes, it's a tough crisis in private, but I think in business, not so tough as we had, for example, in 98. I understand. Thank you very much, Felix. Stay healthy. Stay healthy in Europe. <laughs> you too. Thank Great. you very much. <laughs> yes. Nice. Uh, and we're now moving to the USA and close to New York. Uh, Mr. Alex Depassi is ready to tell you about how is the American market now is uh, going. Hi, Alex. How are you doing? Yeah. How are you, Vasil? Yeah, yeah we, we feel very well. What about you? Ah, <laughs> uh, great, great. You staying uh, safe in Russia? Yeah, yeah, we stay safe, thanks God, yes. <laughs> That's good. That's a great thing, right? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes, please go on uh, and uh, say us about uh, uh, what do you think about this crisis in the United States? Please uh, go by your presentation. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Well, thank you for having me, Vassal, Victor, and uh, everybody at Top Franchise. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today on uh, franchising in the United States. I've been in the uh, franchising industry for over 25 years, uh, seeing the ups and the downs of the markets. Uh, I started off as a franchisor that uh, built a concept to 200 locations throughout the world, ended up uh, selling that company, uh, then uh, worked alongside with some of the top franchisors in America uh, to help expand their brand into Asia, Middle East, Africa, and all throughout the world. Uh, I've had some great opportunities to work with some amazing amazing uh, franchisor leaders, top uh, 10, top 20 uh, franchises in the world uh, that uh, really has, you know, helped uh, grow my knowledge and uh, expertise in the, in the field. Um, I've also uh, worked with numerous companies in 
America and helped them expand all over the world. Malaysia, Cambodia, Singapore, South Africa, uh, China, <clears throat> also have helped companies uh, in and out throughout the world expand into uh, America, uh, which we are going to discuss, uh, you know, is a extremely difficult market. Uh, no doubt about that. Hold on one second here. Okay. So this webinar, we're going to talk about the U.S. market, how to evaluate the U.S. and create a plan for entry. Uh, getting into the United States uh, franchise market is extremely difficult. Uh, it's probably the hardest market to break into um, cost-wise and just uh, from a competitive standpoint. Uh, there's over 3,000 franchise concepts in America right now. And to be, honestly, uh, to be honest with you, most of them uh, don't grow past five to 10 units. Uh, so there's a lot of hurdles before you even get in front of uh, the legal aspects of just breaking into the market. Uh, so we're going to discuss some of that. We're going to discuss maybe things that could possibly help you and your brand in your country, how to generate interest in your franchise offering and sell and, and the steps to obviously franchising in the U.S. So like I said, the mar U.S. market, it is the mecca of franchising. Uh, franchising has been going on here in America for 30, 40, 50 years uh, just in my short time, 25 plus years franchising, I'm just amazed to see how quickly developed uh, countries have developed their franchising market and, and in a way have been less dependent on U.S. franchises to bring in uh, to their countries. And, you know, I was just uh, last year, a couple of years ago, 2019 in the Philippines, uh, at a Philippines uh, franchise event and uh, was just couldn't believe within less than five to 10 years how developed that franchise market had become. And, you know, that is the case throughout the world. Uh, but the U.S. market, you know, there it has tremendous opportunity because it sort of is the melting pot of the world. Uh, you've got people from Asia uh, from Middle East, from Africa, all over the world that, uh, you know, with a diverse ethnicity, diverse religion and culture, uh, that makes it a very unique uh, market. And, and that market, uh, you know, can change whether it's uh, in the New York market, the Florida market, the California market. So there's different pockets and different regions that offer the diverse ethnicity and, and culture groups and, and opportunities in each one of the states. Uh, there's a difference in selling your franchise concept in the Northeast as opposed to the Southeast. But capitalists are, are the ones. Entrepreneurship is very uh, popular here. Uh, we've got a show called Shark Tank that has, uh, you know, obviously driven uh, entrepreneurship uh, to very high levels uh, to where kids are thinking about and wanting to become entrepreneurs. It's the cool thing to be. So it has become very uh, accepting uh, in franchising to uh, allow entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, get into systems, process, and align and partner with uh, brands to still have that entrepreneurship uh, aspect of business, to be in business by yourself, but not for yourself, but not for, by yourself. Um, you know, some of the things that uh, the market presents and, and has, like I said, was the trademark and the IP protection is very strong here. Uh, you're guided by a well-defined legal system that has defined franchise and business regulations in every single state. Um, English is obviously the predominant language, but that is changing as uh, Spanish becomes, uh, you know, uh, will probably overtake uh, the English language as the predominant language in the next, uh, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, majority of the population uh, is educated. That's the normal course of action here. It's still uh, 85 to 95 percent of the kids that graduate high school go on to, to college. Um, 
The market offers incredible supply chain capabilities. Access to capital and financing uh, for franchises is, is abundant. And you know, well-established marketing, advertising, and communications uh, infrastructure is in place. So options for doing business in the US. Um, you, you know, I'll give you the options and then I'll give you my opinions. Obviously, a lot of companies try to break in uh, to test the market with company-owned locations. Um, this has their positives and, and negatives. Uh, a company-owned location requires uh, not only a significant amount of capital, but a tremendous amount of resources and uh, opening up that first single flagship site usually takes a lot longer uh, than people uh, you think that it would take or usually to, to go to the market and franchise. Um, acquiring a company in a similar line of business, joint ventures, agents, uh, distributors, franchising, and licensing. Um, franchising, uh, you know, obviously if for, we're talking companies that are international for this, the sake of this PowerPoint presentation and expanding into uh, the US market. Honestly, the company owned locations are, are great. I see a lot of companies do that. Uh, but nine times out of 10, I see them fail. The, the route, even with franchising, to try to break into this market uh, from an international standpoint, from a foreign company breaking into this market, uh, not only is the cost extremely high, uh, but uh, you know, the, the success rate is not there. Most foreign companies, forget about the foreign companies, most domestic companies that start here in America uh, on the franchising side fail. Uh, so the, the, the odds for international franchises are, are even higher. Uh, but the tack that you know, I suggest for most uh, international franchises is you know, first going in, finding a master franchise partner. Uh, there's an opportunity for experienced franchise, unit franchise, multi-unit franchise operators, experienced franchisees, uh, to want to take and have that right to take a foreign concept and master franchise it in uh, uh, America. Probably the best route because you've got a, a, an experienced business partner that uh, has done it successfully, understands the landscape. Uh, and you know, in addition to that, can uh, get through the, the legal hurdles of the franchising uh, legal structures, uh, filing franchises, filing an FDD, uh, filing it with the FTC, filing it with each one of the states, and it reduces the cost and the exposure for the international uh, brand. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we don't, I'm not gonna go into all of this just for the sake of time, uh, but like I said, the amount of franchising is extremely popular here in America. Everything is franchised. You, you purchase a car, you're buying it from a franchise. You go to a clothes store, you're part, buying from a franchise. You go in to eat, you're going to a franchise. It's just uh, whether it's business services, retail services, personal services, uh, you know, every sector here in America uh, brand names, they offer, uh, you know, the opportunity for consumers to feel comfortable with it, and they're very accepted. Um, major benefits, you know, obviously, of franchising is your ability to enforce your brand standards, and that's governed through what's called the Franchise Disclosure Document, uh, which is a 200-page document that pretty much protects uh, the franchisor, and it lays out everything that uh, the franchisee must abide by. And, you know, that, that's a good thing. It's an intim intimidating thing for new potential franchises that are, are coming into the system, but it's an appreciated thing once they're in the brand uh, to protect the brand uh, standards. <clears throat> uh, franchisee is an independent con uh, contractor, uh, so there's no tax uh, implications or, or issues. It's just uh, a 1099 that is, is paid out. Like we said, clear, well-defined franchise law and regulation, primarily focused on the franchise disclosure document. Uh, it's a 200-page document that is designed to provide your prospective franchisee, like I said, with all of the information that they need to know uh, to make an informed uh, decision. 
prior to getting to that point in time, uh, you know, the, the franchise disclosure document is has to be filed. Certain states are harder to get into. Uh, certain states are registration states, like in New York or California, our registration state where you have a process of not only do you have to file it, but there's questions and uh, requirements that are needed in order for you to even sell in there. So that's usually a three to six month process where a state like Florida, you can just file your FDD once it's completed and you can immediately sell once you have receipt of it being in the mail. So there's all sorts of different uh, state relationship and business opportunity uh, laws uh, for the franchisees. And as I said, if we're talking specifically for this, uh, as if I were, uh, from my experience, looking at expanding into the United States, I would go the master franchise route. I would look for, I wouldn't try to sell single units. I wouldn't bother opening up a company unit, uh, owned unit. I would look for an experienced franchise partner that has done this, built systems. Maybe you know subway guys that own multi, multiple units are, are looking for new investments. There's so many different uh, experienced franchise consult, uh, franchisees, multi-franchisees that have the experience and would love the opportunity to be a master franchisee and, and sit at the top. Uh, and they have the experience, the capital, the resources, the, the network to be able to expand your brand and it minimizes your exposure. I see a lot of brands, like I said, come in here uh, trying to sell franchises on their own uh, through a foreign you know, location. Uh, it, it, it's, it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult. Why enter the U.S. market? You know, it's, uh, you know, diversification, if anything, right? In this past year, what has that taught us? Why are our are, are services like Top Franchise, Victor and Vassal, what they're doing, guys like them, so important uh, to, to brands? They help your brand uh, expand throughout uh, the country, uh, throughout the world. I'm sorry. And why is that, uh, you know, so important? Well, you know, we heard uh, Felix just talk about how Europe is completely shut down uh, right now. I've got franchisors that have uh, franchise masters in, in Europe and, and it's, you know, completely shut down. And then you go to other countries and it's, you know, it's China and, you know, they're back up and running. You come into the United States and we're back up and running. So, uh, you know, in, in each one of the countries, this is, you know, obviously a complete unique anomaly that we went through this past year. I've seen nothing like it before. But whenever there's turbulence in the market, it creates opportunity. And every single turn, downturn that I've, I've worked through and been in the franchise industry, the other side of this is much brighter uh, and, and, and creates so much opportunity. So you know, if you're sitting back and, and worrying, you know, you see a lot of, there's two types of investors and two types of entrepreneurs that grow with their brands. And the ones that uh, are sitting back and are nervous about the market and look at the glass half empty and, and the situation uh, and, and say, well, now's not the right time to expand. Now's not the right time to look. I'm, I'm concerned about what's going to happen. This is going to end. This is going to be over uh, this year. Now, while things may be slower, is your time and opportunity to prepare yourself, to start marketing, to start developing, expanding, and diversifying your business. Uh, you know, the U.S. market, I, you know, I, I don't want to scare anybody, but I want to tell the truth, and it is a tough market. But the rewards, uh, private equity uh, are gobbling up companies uh, that once you hit the 50-unit, 100-unit mark, uh, you're looking at private equity companies that are buying in at 20 time EBITDA, which is just simply outrageous numbers. So the private equity market here in the United States uh, is very, very strong. Money is extremely cheap. Uh, you know, the franchise market is very well accepted. Uh, the growth potentials, but those are for top brands. So that's the carrot. That's the golden nugget. And why this market offers so much, you know, potential, and, and and so many people try to get into this market, but the failure rate is obviously is extremely high, and it has to be done properly. 
So creating a plan, what is, you know, what are the goals and the objectives, right? If, like, like I said, you know, why do you want to come into this country? What are you hoping to get out of it? Well, obviously that's, that's very simple. You want to expand the brand. You want to diversify the business. You want a potential to potentially uh, grow and, and sell that concept to our private equity. Once you expand, um, you know, the market acceptance of a concept uh, is sort of what you have to work with and, and understand, does this concept uh, re going to work in in United States? Has it worked uh, in our country? It may work in, in China, it may work in Singapore, it may work in Malaysia or, or Dubai, but would it work here in America? That's, you know, uh, the million dollar question. Uh, you know, there's a lot of research that can be done to understand the, the market and acceptance of a concept, but let's say the concept is uh, something that potentially can grow here. Obviously modifications required. Uh, how do we modify the, the, uh, the current offering uh, to meet the local market demand? Uh, how do we set up the cost and support of the modifications? How do we develop modifications? What is the initial ongoing support that we're going to provide? Again, let me revert back. This is why it's so important to align with somebody that has done this successfully. A mass, a, a multi-unit franchisee that has built franchise systems from Subway, McDonald's, Burger King, whatever, someone that has that experience that wants to sit on the top and develop for you. Uh, because they are, without that resource and somebody with the experience, uh, you know, it's, it's an extremely difficult process. And they're going to, you know, help with the pricing. How, what is the cost, the competition? You know, it's essentially a, you know, and, and whether that is through a purchase and sale of a master franchise, or it's through, uh, you know, a business partnership. And both parties are, are going to invest into uh, the, the business. Um, development strategy, I, I'm just going to just get through just for, for obviously uh, time purposes. I don't want to run over too much here product sourcing and distribution, all of the issues here. So four steps to lead generation. And this could be used at uh, for any franchise sale anywhere in the world. Define your market and uh, your of qualified prospects. Who is the ideal profile that is going to fit for your franchise? Who is your ideal franchise? Conf you know, create that franchise success profile first before you even think of promoting your franchise opportunity. And then what is that message? What is the message that motivates the buyer? Uh, you know, who motivates your buyer? People that buy opportunities, not businesses. And, you know, what are the business buyers looking for? Understanding exactly what your message is and who you're targeting and, and what that ideal person is going to be. The lead source, uh, you know, here in America, just a, a little bit about that. If we were looking at this, um, you know, five, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, you know, the, the way we sold franchises here in America, you know, when, at least when I started 25 years ago, we would have place a, a newspaper ad. We'd have people come to a hotel room, uh, a hotel uh, convention center and sell, or we would uh, go to their place of business it was completely different. The way it means communication now are, have changed dramatically. Uh, but what has happened here, even in America too, is franchise brokers have really, uh, you know, taken over the franchise sales process. Uh, you know, there are a lot of domestic, a lot of really good uh, franchise broker associations here uh, in America that, uh, you know, have pretty much all of the top uh, VP of franchise developments that have left the franchisor brands to go and start up franchise uh, broker companies or just become franchise brokers. And 80% of the business that is being sold here uh, in America is, is going through the franchise brokers. Fran magazines, franchise expos, uh, you know, really a lot of the, the past uh, and very costly. Um, and, you know, obviously Google is 
definitely one of the top means of, of generating leads. So buyer motivation, what motivates franchisees? Well, what are they going to be looking for? They're going to be looking for proven systems, an established brand, um, operating economy, shared knowledge. What is the success of your brand in your country? Is it something that would be unique here? You know, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of food concepts here in America. You know, those are probably the hardest to, uh, you know, develop and grow and expand in America. Uh, educational services, business services, a little bit easier, uh, you know, less overhead. Maybe it's a home-based mobile type of business. You know, so these are all of the things that, you know, I do, I help and assist uh, through Global Franchise Exchange. And my experience and my contacts with, uh, you know, within the franchise industry here in America to say, listen, don't even bother, don't even waste your time uh, looking for somebody as a business partner expanding into this country. Because, um, you know, it, it's obviously the, the brand has to have worked in your country, uh, ideally in other countries prior to expanding here in America. And then, uh, you know, looking at it, okay, does it make sense for the U.S. market? So here in, in America, you have several types of franchise buyers. You know, they, the logical person is somebody that's going to read the FDD carefully, uh, read the agreements. They're going to choose an industry that best suits their backgrounds and lifestyles. They're going to look over the item 19, financial investments, the return of the franchise concept, determine if it's a fit with the franchise culture, um, you know, and they're going to compare different franchise offerings uh, to that. And they're going to go step by step by step. The other one is a, uh, the emotional franchise purchaser. And some people buy franchises on emotions because uh, their spouse or the job, their home, they don't follow a logic path. It's they uh, are excited about uh, the, the, uh, pat their, their, their industry or the passion of what they, they do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of an emotional purchase. Uh, research is often imperfect, not reading the disclosure. Uh, you know, they're, they're just emot motivated. Most, most of the time, the emotional people, uh, buyers, the franchise buyers here in America are the ones that are chasing uh, a brand that is expanding really quickly, has, uh, you know, incredible financial return, maybe fun and exciting and, and are not really looking and pulling back uh, the onions to see really what is the best fit for them. It may not necessarily be the best fit. Why do people purchase uh, franchises? Be their own boss, general independence, uh, do something they love. A lot of times when the market downturns, what I said, when uh, like the financial uh, um, downturn here in the United States back in 2008, 2009, you saw a tremendous boom right after because uh, people were being laid off at their jobs. And, uh, you know, 50 years old, 51 years old, corporate executives. It's still uh, today's uh, industry, business environment. Uh, you'll see executives, marketing executives, business executives, C-suite executives uh, give their lives and have incredible jobs as chief marketing officers, CEOs of companies, and then be uh, eliminated by the number crunches at 51, 52 years old. And those guys are don't know what to do because they're, they're worth too much. Nobody else is going to pick them up in the industry. So they're, they are ideal people. Those are usually the people that I'm going after if it's not somebody with franchise experience because they've got the corporate executive experience. They're in a situation where they're too young to, to retire. And they just understand, you know, from a big corporate uh, experience, they understand systems, process, uh, and, and, and work out usually well. So the average franchise can, cons, candidate, the uh, name recognition, 40% say joining a brand is not vital. Um, you know, we have brands uh, here in America, uh, you know, concepts, uh, smash my trash. Uh, that is a concept that last year during uh, the COVID pandemic, 
sold in it's rough it's it's over 250 300 uh, franchises a complete no name brand in America but it's a new cutting edge um, technology and business uh, so you know that's where there's certain opportunities in this market uh, don't necessarily have to be a known brand but it's something unique uh, and if it's something unique that we can bring into this country, it, uh, there is a market for it. And, you know, I think year end at this point in time, this brand is about 350 units sold within the first year. And there's brands, uh, you know, you give multiple examples of different types of concepts and brands that, uh, you know, fall under that umbrella. A very new brand, new into the market, only uh, one year, two years uh, you know, in business and, you know, the, the sales uh, of franchise sales are just off the charts. Uh, they usually don't even hit the public or the market or the entrepreneur magazine top uh, 500 list uh, for years, two, three years down the road. Um, but, you know, 70% of uh, or more will visit the corporate office for what's called a day of discovery. Obviously, uh, why should 100% uh, visit your office? Well, it, it shows their intent. It shows, uh, you know, they're they're serious about uh, the business. Uh, and this is, you know, I look at each one of the relationships when you're bringing on a franchisee as a business partner. They're buying into your know-how, your systems, your process, your team, and you're buying into their in-country or in, you know, market uh, experience. Um, so. <clears throat> five critical points of, of, of qualification. Um, obviously, uh, you know, intelligence, uh, do they, what's, what's their background? What's their experience? How does it correlate to the, uh, you know, the job set, the skill set requirements for the franchise? Capitalization. Uh, this is probably the biggest reason uh, most franchisees fail and you see a lot of franchisors, they make that mistake. They sell to anybody and everybody initially. And those first five, 10, 15, 20 franchises, yeah, they're out of the gate very quickly. But you look and you peel back the onion, the reason they failed is because they didn't have the capital uh, resources to uh, maybe weather a storm like uh, 2020 or have the capital to expand and develop the brand. Uh, you know, you, you have to look long term contracts, franchise agreements are here in America for 10 years. And we, you know, it's important to have somebody that's well capitalized because uh, nine times out of 10, the franchise is not going to uh, be positive uh, cash flow be until, you know, maybe their first, second year. Uh, you know, so they've got to have that capital to uh, sustain that initial startup time. And it's the franchisees job, the franchisor's job to do that due diligence, you know, to understand who this person is, what is their work ethic, how does, you know, are they coming from a, a C corp, uh, a C uh, executive suite where they were a CMO, how does that translate or were they coming from a technology IT job that, you know, they were in IT and maybe are uh, coming into a business service that involves a lot of B2B, B2C interaction with uh, a customer or a lot of sales uh, and talking, you know, does their personality and their job experience that they've had fit that? Are they going to fit into? Yeah, they may have the 35,000, 50,000 and plenty of capital uh, and great work ethic and extremely smart, but do they have this set, the personality uh, to be able to, you know, develop your brand and grow your brand? Will it be well received into the market? So you've got to look at, you know, what is the, what are the skill sets for my franchise to be successful and look at what their experience is. And as you're going through the sales process, you know, se selling a franchise is not uh, a process that happens overnight. It's not like selling a car, they come into uh, you know, the showroom and they purchase one. Sales process should, should be a, a lengthy uh, six to seven step process 
We, you get to learn a little bit about them. They get to learn a little bit about you. And then at the end of the road, at the end of the journey, you are going to get a good feel for who this person is. You're going to have different f- members of your team uh, talking with them. You're going to have different franchisees with existing franchisees meeting with them and, and talking with them. Uh, so it's really, really important uh, you know, that you look at you know, these critical points of qualification and you take your time when selecting franchisees because you, the minute you get, uh, you know, you, you can bring in 10 uh, franchisees quickly into an organization. You can have an amazing first year. You've collected, uh, you know, $35,000, $350,000 in franchise revenue. But what's on the back end of it? Now, the second year, they're into the franchise system and they're not operating well. They're not doing uh, great business. So if you don't have uh, that foundation and you have cracks in that foundation, you're not growing anywhere past the 10, 15, 20 uh, units. Uh, and, and that's usually what, what happens here. People are very quick to just, oh, you have the money. Okay. Uh, you, they accept them in and they don't take them through the sales process. They don't do the due diligence. They don't get to understand, is this somebody that I truly want to be a business partner with? Franchise sales are very predictable. A good concept, the right message, a great marketing plan uh, with adequate marketing budget uh, you know, a great sales process uh, it equals leads. Now, leads, uh, you know, equal meetings uh, and, and taking them through the sales process, uh, which then turns into franchise sales. But again, that process uh, of bringing in uh, uh, people, you've got to take them through that due diligence immediately in the beginning. You know, you're, you're weaning out. We have a sales process here that we give to our franchisors that I can share if you want to email me. Uh, I can share what uh, a lot of the top franchisors in America are using for their sales process, uh, their franchise applications to screen uh, and see whether or not they have the capital, whether or not they have this skill set uh, and match up to their profile within uh, the system that maybe you can localize into your, uh, your market as well. Uh, done right, it's 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 a numbers game. Uh, slower growth is is better than faster growth. Slower growth with the right franchisors that build the foundation that become the validators uh, and and validate because once you start to get to that five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten number, if you've got a great concept, if you're you've got a, a proven business model, uh, a, a model that is unique for the market and uh, there's some demand for it, you know, it's going to, it's, it's then going to go down to what are the franchisees validating about your system. So bringing in those initial franchisees in the beginning is extremely important uh, to bring in, uh, you know, the right people and, and have those uh, people that are going to validate your system and help grow. <clears throat> so, I'm going to, I know I've uh, probably a little bit over time here. This is just uh, a little bit, you know, what we do, who I am, my team. Uh, I've got a team here in the United States. Like I've said, I've been in the business. I've been a a franchisor. Uh, I've worked with the top brands. I've worked with brands here in America to help them develop international brands, to help them uh, develop here. Uh, We stay in the process from, you know, first communication all the way through uh, introducing them to private equity companies, uh, sales, development, and, and, and growth into the country. We have uh, locations and expansions in, uh, in country uh, partners uh, throughout the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm based here out of uh, New York City and, um, you know, really appreciative of Vassal and Victor allowing me to come on here to top franchise. But, you know, if I could it, add one last thing, now is not the time to be sitting, uh, you know, and worrying about the market. Now is the time to get aggressive, uh, to talk to, to Vassal, to talk to Victor, top franchise team, and, and figure out your strategies and expanding into the market. Because I'm talking from experience, 25 years, uh, this, the other side of this uh, is going to be uh, much brighter. And, you know, while you have the time and the downtime, prepare for this uh, and, and get, uh, diversified throughout uh, the world. 
Thank you very much, Alex. <laughs> Thank you very for your very detailed presentation. I feel that uh, uh, I, I also want to bring uh, our clients, our partners to the American market. <laughs> <laughs> so enthusiastic and energetic. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wish to stay healthy. Have a good day. Thank you very much for your early uh, coming. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Goodbye. my friend. Yes. All right. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Uh, 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 please uh, uh, say uh, on your uh, comments on our video uh, uh, your contact details and uh, uh, to all our listeners who is uh, listening to us and uh, who with us now, uh, I just uh, want to ask you to uh, type text uh, in your um, video, what you see now, our conference, your name, which country are you from, and uh, what other questions do you have to the, our speakers? We have time now to answer the questions and we will provide all these questions to our speakers and connect all of you, each other to our speakers. You can type me and uh, my personal contacts also will be here in our chat, in our conference. And uh, uh, I ask my colleagues uh, to type on the uh, our uh, video um, uh, stream, uh, all the contact details of uh, our organizers. And uh, you also can, I ask in, uh, our uh, honorable speakers, to put your contact details to all these chats, to Zoom, to uh, the, this our room, and uh, uh, to the um, stream broadcasting your contact details. And this would be very good. So let me say a few words uh, uh, like a resume of our conference today. Uh, this is our first, our first uh, um, global franchise conference. Uh, we will be. Uh, uh, we will expand this conference uh, to other markets. Today, it was uh, uh, the speaker from Singapore, uh, two speakers from Europe, one speaker from Russia, one speaker from uh, USA. And uh, we see how it's happening, what is happening now in these uh, areas. And once you are going to expand your franchise globally, or you uh, want to start your franchise business as a franchisee, uh, please uh, contact our speakers, uh, the franchise development experts, all of the speakers and uh, for promotion of your franchise and promoting of your brand and the choosing the right company which you can buy a franchise you can uh, use our marketplace and uh, uh, i just want to say uh, to show my uh, shorter presentation to the final conversation and i want to ask my colleagues to uh, let me uh, show this uh, uh, slide and uh, I want to say a few words about the top franchise company, about our marketplace. We unite uh, the more than 2,000 franchise globally. We have our team uh, experience. It's more than 15 years. And uh, uh, we're organizing such as events online and offline. We participate in, participate in the top uh, franchise exhibitions globally. And we have your own booths and the country booths in these conferences. Uh, when it will come all the offline shows and the exhibitions in Europe, in USA, in Asia, in Africa, we will join and we will see each other. Let's plan this. Now, all our clients uh, who is happy to, to work with the top franchises already leave their response here. You can uh, check all these kind of brands. They already have the leads and the opening through our marketplace. Uh, this is all of our partners. You can see here all of our speakers, all of our experts, and plus the offline events. That is a franchise uh, expo in France and the read exhibitions globally and especially in Singapore also. What about the traffic? We have more than 1 million people coming to our marketplace globally. So you can expand your brand here. And uh, uh, we have the uh, traffic and the investors from the, all over the world. Uh, here you can see uh, what kind of countries is the most active in our marketplace. Uh, it's the USA, it's India, it's uh, Saudi Arabia and all kind of uh, uh, Gulf countries. Yes, which is uh, rich and uh, they're expanding 
to the other markets and they uh, have the very strong demand to buy any franchise. We're strong in Pakistan, in Malaysia, and uh, so all the English speaking countries now coming uh, to our marketplace to search for the good franchise opportunities. So uh, for this year, uh, you can choose uh, your way how to expand where to expand and uh, uh, we the organizers of the global franchise conference all of our speakers wish you a, a success in the franchise industry and in this movement uh, to become a rich and to become happy with the franchise and uh, i really want to say uh, thank you to all of our speakers who uh, is now in the early uh, morning like Alex in the US and uh, uh, late night in uh, uh, Singapore like uh, uh, Albert Kong and uh, uh, in the daytime now in Europe. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you for all uh, your support to make this happen. Uh, I, I would like to say thank you to all participants. Uh, we are really appreciate and respect that you joined this global franchise conference. This whole video will be stored in YouTube and also we will send you links by emails right after the conference. Please write down your contact details, write down your all question that you have. We have a, a few seconds to answer that. And uh, I see some persons from Jamaica. Yes. And uh, I respect and I uh, mention everyone. Yes. And you can see the all of your contact details here. If you have the request to buy franchise, ask directly all of our speakers. They have the portfolio of the very good brands. Uh, Yes. Uh, and uh, if you want to develop franchise in Europe, you can contact the Mr. Felix David. If you want to develop franchise in the uh, US, also please uh, contact Mr. Alex Depassier. And if you want to develop franchise in Asia, uh, contact uh, Mr. Albert Kong. So in, in this case, uh, you get all this information, how to expand your brand. And uh, please use all this information to make success of your own brand and uh, the steel franchise industry is very strong is very good perspective and uh, we also work on it and uh, let's see each other on the next conference that we will start in the several months thank you very much we are finished now our conference and i uh, really happy that it's happened today thank you very much take care all of you guys bye thank you we have a few uh, seconds uh, stay here that you can put your own name, your country and your questions and your company profile, send it to us, start promote your franchise. Thank you very much. Take care. Stay healthy.